Hello, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, and welcome to another episode of Phanalysis, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I'm Ready Ford, this is Evan Never95. Hello. And this is Gensu I1. Just and loyal and afraid of toil. Uh, today we're going to be covering the Death Day Party, um, which, aside from a few little discussions about squibs and the end of the chapter leading to the blood writing on the wall, uh, it's about, as you might expect, the Death Day Party. So let's jump right in. Uh, and Give it all. <laughs> <laughs> Evan loves this chapter. He's a, he's a big fan. Um, and well, jump... I don't hate it. It's just so little of consequence. Happens. Yeah, yeah this will be a short one. About three things to discuss and that's it. Um, but yeah, we open up with the, uh, with the weather being miserable. It's that time of year in Hogwarts and... Uh, Harry's trudging his way into the castle after a long day of practice, encountering nearly headless Nick. Well, nearly headless Nick has yet again, his application to join the headless hunt has just been rejected again, and he's very, very bitter about it. Because you like, <laughs> yeah, and by, I do. You know? And on this note, I do feel just a bit of sympathy for poor nearly headless Nick because he can't even get a good, cool afterlife, and his death sucked because it was explained that he was executed by 50 blows from a blunt axe that didn't even fully kill, that didn't even fully decapitate him. It was just, you know, head is still attached by some sinew. So he's not fully headless and his death was horrifically painful. Mm. You, think they'd, you think they'd stop after they realized it wasn't working. <laughs> well, I guess the the, yeah, is, that is was that a committed, inefficient uh, executioner. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, <laughs> nope. The problem is, is that 100% success I've, rate. I'm going to do this. I've actually done some research on how executions were pulled off back then. And the idea is, is that if you were being killed by beheading, you actually had to pay to have the axe properly sharpened so you could be killed with one blow. Because <laughs> well, you got to think about it this way. This is medieval times. If they're going in for an execution, it's not just about executing you. It's about making an example. So a painful decapitation from 50 blows from a blunt axe because you can't afford to pay for the axe to be sharpened. Par for the Ooh. course for that time period. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> which also kind of says something about poor Nicholas's financial state. He was probably a disgraced noble when he was executed. What the hell did this guy do to get Alan, an execution? Alan, your ancestors, man, they they were hardcore. <laughs> Demimsy Porpenton, poor guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it introduces us to the concept of the Death Day party because uh, he's uh, or the Death Day rather because that's the date that he had date. died on 500 years ago which uh, as you said before the recording connor which i hadn't realized was the actual date that gave us the um timeline for when these books were running um yes set. uh it's stated yeah, it's in this first chapter first major, first major tidbit <clears throat> yeah it's stated in this chapter that this is uh sir sir nicholas's 500th death day and his the date of his death death is given as october 31st 1492 so do some math. That means that this storyline is taking place in 1992, which means that the whole the film adaptations should have done this as a 90s period piece. <laughs> yeah, so not showing the Millennium yeah. Bridge before it was even built. Uh, to name but one example. <laughs> but the inconsistencies that we mentioned before in the in the uh, in the previous book were in the books as well, because you know Play PlayStation One, for example, um, is present when it shouldn't have been. But uh, right. but yeah, this this uh, leads into the idea of the, the Death Day Party. Um, being set up for later in the chapter and uh before we get there we get the introduction of or the re uh interruption as well looking for the interruption of uh filch and his cat because harry's you know trailing mud everywhere yeah. i feel Nick really tries bad to for give him filch. a warning but that didn't that didn't really work out too yeah well. a little too little too little too late on that one but he does help yeah. in a bit as we'll discuss but uh, yeah i feel i feel bad for filch because granted yeah he's an ass but he is also one hell of a dedicated caretaker I mean, he is scrubbing things by hand all over the castle, and day in, day out, every single day, somebody is screwing it up for him. Yeah, and the other thing is just the fact that with the whole discussion of squibs, squibs are actually stuck in a really awkward position where they're not fully parts of wizard society because they can't use magic, but they don't really have the option of just going and living as a muggle because the problem is, is that they're still being raised in a wizard household isolated from muggles, which means that even the muggles are going to be viewing them as oddballs and weirdos. Like, mm. there's just no place that these poor bastards can fit in. They're outcasts and misfits no matter where they turn. Hmm. It would be it would be an interesting like little and if they had like a little anthology about the life of a squib, you know, just a little 
little thing, maybe on Pottermore or something. That'd be interesting. Mm. Is, there, there are also certain be... things that they could do as well. Like, they're not completely yeah. severed from the magical community. They, they can still make use of certain magical means, certain things like potions, for example. You know, they have access to some of this stuff. It's just it's to be so limited and you know not being able to have any real wand work in play. It, it must be so frustrating. Like. Oh, Almost like it raises the question of you know would you prefer to be a completely ignorant of the world as a muggle or would you rather be you know but one step away where you can ju you can see everything and then be just a step away and, and in touch with it but never really dive in and be a part of that world. Yeah, which also kind of raises the question. I wonder if any squibs have ever chosen to obliviate themselves and then try and go live in the real world. Mm, or have themselves yeah obliviated by the uh, government. There's yeah, probably sorry, a yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. Pro there's and, a procedure for that. Yeah, there's probably a procedure for that. I wouldn't be surprised. And the other the problem. The other problem is the fact that because that they're still raised as part of the wizarding world, even though they're like I just mentioned this a moment ago, they're still insulated from the muggle world. They're still just as ignorant about the muggle world as regular wizards because they were raised in the mm. wizarding community. And the wizards, because they just don't take muggles seriously, they truly are that cut off from what the muggles do. It's like, do you honestly think that that Filch would be able to get a similar get a job? What, do you think he's qualified to get a job in the Muggle world? No, probably not. Unless he's going to be a caretaker, and in that case, he may as well stay in Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I can understand his position. I mean, obviously, I, obviously, we learned this from uh, that was um, squibdom from the, uh, the letter that was left on his desk that Harry just noses about in, as you do. Yeah. And um, we learned about the quick spell course, which is almost certainly you know useless. I, I can't imagine that that kind of um, the way it's presented, that it's, it's the sort of thing that can actually provide assistance to Squibs. So, yeah, probably one of those Ponzi schemes. Probably not in any like serious capacity. Mm. Although it is yeah. interesting whether or not there is a way of squeezing you know the apps, you know the tiniest bit of magic out of them. Whether or not there is some you know potential for very very slight growth. You know it hasn't really been explored. I don't think in the setting. And there's anything yeah. is, you know there's anything on Pottermore now that I've I've missed because obviously I'm, I'm way out of touch with the stuff that's gone up there um, in the last few years. If, if if there is, I don't know about it either. So mm. you could go one way or the other. Mm. But uh, as uh, Filch is prepping to you know drop the uh, hammer on <laughs> Harry as he is always want to do, uh, Nicholas drops the or gets Peas to drop the um, cabinet upstairs, the vanishing cabinet that is in no way relevant to the overall story of a, or a plot of this series. You know, it's just a just a random thing that exists and will never come up again. Um, and yeah, he, he drops it above the how office. It could. Well, the funny thing is, is that even though we mention it as something that has come up, it's like, how many things are there that are mentioned that literally do just come up mm. once and never come up again? It's it's a way of just working in your little stealth references and foreshadowings without anyone noticing. You make sure you drop a lot of one-offs that never come up, so that way the things that do come up just blend in. Yeah, absolutely. And we've said many times, and we'll again in the future, I'm sure, that the uh... Rowling is excellent at this. You know, the previous chapter, for example, did it like three or four times, making those uh, r vague allusions to things, even if it's just a one one off uh, reference. Um, that, as you said, some will come back up in very major capacities and some will just sit there untouched again. So you can never really tell on the first viewing what, you know, the wood for the trees. Um, it's very effective. And yeah, and so, you know, Nick, Nick interrupts this and has uh, Harry rescued from the situation and uh, as a you know way of thanks Harry offers you know I wish there was something I could do for you and the, the invitation to the party is given um, which I'm sure Harry very much regrets uh, looking back on this moment <laughs> I mean he's, he, it is an example of um, of uh, Harry being you know just kind just, there was there was no real plot requirement attached to this it was just a case of okay I'm gonna you know I, I'm gonna be generous and kind and I offer to help and you know this is what gets thrown his way and he just goes with it it's uh, it's nice that um we get to see this kind of side of him and the rest of the trio as well who do go along with him um you know being good when they don't really have, really have anything to gain from it I do you kind of enjoy about this uh, particular chapter like once the death day party gets going is that like this is before the proper explanation of what ghosts are in Harry Potter 5 but we kind of get our first little foreshadowing of the wistfulness of ghosts because it's like they're just stuck in this imitation life and all they can really do is just play their own games with themselves because they can't really participate in life. It's like even their parties are always just pale shadows of what these things should be. Mm. I mean, the, the, when they actually reach the party and we get start seeing what they're kind of, the sort of things that are going on here, it's just... A little depressing. It, it was yeah. de depressing, you know, from the very concept alone, but then when they get there and see all these things, you know, the, the horrible screeching music, the the... I mean the rotting food, all oh, the visuals and the, the 
evocative stench that she managed to to supply on with the pros not pleasant um but at the I same know. time it, you know you, there's a certain degree of sense to it you know like Imani mentions um i suppose that they want to let the strong the, the, uh, the, the flavor kind of ferment so that it's, it's at its strongest possible state and no matter how unpleasant just so there's that little possibility that they might be able to, to taste it themselves um which again i guess it's also worth uh, i guess it's also worth worth mentioning that while that <clears throat> while the film obviously didn't adapt this this scene uh the video game did Mm, yes, though interesting, interestingly enough, not the PS2 version. Um, only the PS1 right. one that was followed on from the original game. They kind of, and the there, was, there were two versions of the or two different games that were made for the same book, which is and uh, the Game Boy version. Yeah, yeah, which was interesting. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that that was included in there. That's worth noting. No of note. Other thing that's worth noting about the uh, Death Day scene is um, the introduction once again of, of those little tidbits that come up later. Um, this born being moaning Myrtle. Um, you know, Hermione's like, oh god, no, let's stay clear and um, hide me. <laughs> Let's not go near her. Um, and, and yeah, we get that brought up here as well. So there's lots of stuff that, just, again, gets listed out throughout this chapter, even though it's not a particularly essential one by itself, that, you know, she does a good job of stretching out um, the, the content she's providing. Mm. Yeah. The other thing I do kind of find interesting, because we were just discussing a moment ago the rotting food and the, how the ghosts are trying to let the food ferment. Their music seems to follow a similar trend because mm. here it's described as a bunch of musical saws and it's like basically the sounds of fingernails scraping on blackboards. And it's another little area where it's like their kind of their deadened senses mean that the only thing that they'll register are the most extreme versions of something. So it's like it's almost like. I, I'm just trying to imagine the experience of what it is as a ghost to try listening to music because I just kind of get the impression that it's like even their perception of the world, every all the colors are kind of muted. It's like it's almost like things are inverted from how others see them. It's almost like I get the impression that a ghost would probably see himself as himself, but the world around him is ghostly and not there. But it's because he's well, it's kind of the same idea as the ring wraiths. They're one foot in both worlds. They're not entirely here they're just trying to hold themselves here but it's all they're doing is causing themselves pain and the sad thing is is that for these ghosts they don't even have the option of destroy the ring cast aside your horrible ring of power and accept death they're they're stuck this way they're met they're trapped between planes of existence and can't do anything about it just saying i totally called that you'd mentioned ring roast in the chapter antoine and matt are going to yeah. be laughing their asses off when they watch this <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the thing I find interesting about that, though, kind of just say, is, is that you can kind of interpret your own different way about it because she never fully defines the ghosts. Um, you know, we get some some stuff later on in, in the later books, as you mentioned, but we never get the full kind of um, just. She never lays it down and explains detail by detail, which is you know what what other things are like. She doesn't explain the magic on it um, because you know they can clearly hear people without it being um, just warped or anything because they can have perfectly manageable conversations with you know the students. So. It's not like they can't hear music. It's just how, what kind of um, you know emotional resonance can they get from it if it's not taken to the extreme, like with all of the senses they're clearly trying to demonstrate here. You know, the ice cold room, the the mute screeching music, the the rotting food, um, the company, if nothing else, because they're all a bit flat, you know um, flamboyant in their ways. So it's just everything's kind of amped up, and, and that's just unpleasant for the living, and and maybe maybe more perceptible for the dead. We don't really know. It's nice that they kept the question open. Yep. But yeah, um, aside from the Moaning Myrtle thing that being introduced, that's basically the last in, you know, important note from the Death Day party, right? I mean, it's basic character stuff for Nick. This is basically, essentially the last thing we ever really hear about from Nick, you know, in terms of develop, development, isn't it? This is the last time in the series that we have any sort of focus on him besides his just occasional line. Unless I'm mistaken, yeah. that's correct, right? For the most part, yeah. Mm. So uh, yeah, with that we just leave the but party. They, leave, and, they uh, leave to go back to the tower, but on the way... Harry hears things again. Yes, he starts hearing more uh, threatening words this time. You know, rip, dare, kill. Um, and the ice melt blood thing. So that, that kind of gets them leading up into the corridor where we encounter the writing on the wall for the first time. Name of the next chapter. Yep. And of course, uh, petrified Mrs. Norris. Yep. 
<laughs> and that's basically this chapter, guys, because everything we can discuss about this end wrapping up bit is. Uh, we is, can't really say much more without yeah, leading it's, into it the next. May one. as well just save it for the next chapter, because yeah, th this is one of those chapters where, like I said, they, they put like the tidbits in, and we, we get like, like dun, a little bit dun, of fleshing dun, out. Dun, yeah, you know? you, it's a good, yeah. it's a good example of one of her chapter ends. You know, hooks you in for the next chapter, even with just looking at the next chapter's title. You know, writing on the wall. It's a very good ending to it. But it's, essentially, the chapter by itself is just it's, it's. There's only so much discussion you can levy at it. It's it just introduces a few new concepts. Um, it shows some tidbit stuff that will come up later on in the series or even this book and uh, and essentially leaves it at that. So more to discuss next time. It ends on a little bit of a cliffhanger, but the thing is, is that the cliffhanger directly relates to the next chapter. So just for, you know, expediency, we'll be discussing that in the next chapter. Indeed. Writing on the wall. Yeah. Uh, that's essentially our thoughts on this on this very very small and in relatively insignificant chapter. Um, let us know in the comments section down below anything we have missed uh, that you, or you that you want us to discuss in greater detail at some point later. Not that I expect anything. Um, I am ready for, and I still don't have an outro. Evan Nova ninety five. We hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you guys later. Mischief managed. Um, I. I don't, have a, I don't have a I don't have a quote from this chapter to use. Usually, I end with Mr. a quote. Like, Mr. Enemies of the yes. air, beware! Of course. Fail, fail! Abort! Abort! Abort!